This public event. You can't, can't hear me? Is that any better? It's all just used to be louder. Does this sound better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Your attendance is very much appreciated this evening. Evening. We did plan on starting right at 5.30 so that we could get you out of here exactly at 7 o'clock. That's okay. We're going to still shoot for this event to end at 7 o'clock. There will be time for question and answers in this agenda. And we really hope to see you engage and ask some really great, great questions of the panelists this evening. We're going to start this event by me telling you who I am. <laughs> My name is Maggie O'Leary, and I am going to moderate and facilitate this event this evening. Also, the first thing we're going to do is do thanks. There are a lot of people to thanks for this entire effort. The first will be the funders. Big Sky Resort Area District, Gallatin County, and Madison County. Now, I know we have some people in the room. Danny, hello. Thank you, Bizrad. Who else from Bizrad? Mike Scholes. I think you were on the board in 2016. I think you were a member that voted to fund this effort. Thank you for that. I don't see Kavish or Renee or anybody else, but we do have Mike here to thank. The next set of people to thank are the stakeholders. Take a look at Logo Salad here. This is a graphic of everybody that's been involved in this process. It's, qu it's quite startling. It's, it's quite astonishing. There are developers. There are ecologists. There are recreationists. There are environmentalists. You name it, these people came together. Spend a little bit of time looking at that and just thinking about the importance of that collaboration. It's a really big deal. Thank you, and your efforts are acknowledged. The next group are the citizens, the engaged citizens and the concerned citizens. Some of you back in 2016 engaged in public meetings. You also took survey. So you are part of what informed this plan. Thank you for that. The next set of thank yous is to these people up here on the panel. They're the ones that are sticking their neck out to talk about it. And thank you for your time. Everybody but Kristen had to drive, much like many of you. Um, I'm going to take the next five minutes and have each of you introduce yourselves and tell us what it is you love about this plan. Kristen, we'll start with you. You get them in. My name is Kristen Gardner. I'm CEO of the Gallatin River Task Force. And what I love about this plan is uh, working collaboratively with lots of different different partners on my favorite topic, water. Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Bossie, and I'm the Northern Rockies Regional Director for American Rivers. I'm based in Bozeman. Uh, I really value this plan. I'm not going to use love because I reserve that for family members. <laughs> Your dogs. My dog. Um, what I really like about it is the diversity of stakeholders that are involved today and honestly have been involved for, for like 20 years. Some of the same people. So we've been able to build trust over that long period of time. And that allows us to work together from the development community to the conservation community and everything in between in ways that few communities have been able to do. Johnny O'Connor, I'm the Executive Director for Big Sky Water and Sewer District. I'm gonna second everything that they've uh, said. I've been here for about a year, but I've been progressively working in conservation and sustainability most of my career. So I like the fact that, uh, you know, this is a community of partners that have all participated in, uh, in this plan. Uh, Mike Richter, Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. Uh, I think what I like about this plan is that it thinks big, there's a lot to do, and there's a lot in the plan. 
Uh, my name is Connor Parrish. I'm a project manager with Child Unlimited, primarily working here in the Gallatin doing restoration work. Um, and I mean, everyone's pretty much covered all of it, but yeah, the plan is really exciting. Great group of stakeholders who really want to try to take care of our, our watershed and our streams here in the Gallatin. So excited to be part of it. Thank you. Okay, in the past 10 to 15 years, there's been a question that many of you are asking. How can Big Sky continue to develop and grow, keeping in mind what the limit to water supply, water availability, and the proper treatment and disposal of wastewater? At the same time, how do we sustain and protect the public's health and safety and sustain the ecological health of the watershed? With that potent question as the foundation, Gallup River Task Force in 2016 took the lead and entered into an initiative to talk to, to, to determine if there was sufficient public interest and enough common interest between stakeholders to create a community-based watershed plan. That is a big mouthful. It's taken me a long time to get there. Uh, I, I don't come from this background. I come from a comms and marketing and PR background. And so all those words are hard, and this group has had a challenge putting the, this all together to try to talk to citizens. And that's that's one of the things that we're doing here tonight is we're trying to figure out how we can talk to you, talk better, get the message out. So from, 20, from January of 2016 to April of 2016, this group got together performed all of these events to try to understand if there was an, enough interest. And by April, it was obvious that there was enough interest. We have enough common ground. So facilitated by Karen Filipovich, if you could raise your hand over there. Thank you for all your hard work. Karen's been hard at this since 2016 and she has not taken her foot off the gas. And herding logo salad is not easy. Karen facilitated this process and these people sat down, rolled up their sleeves and got to work. Of the many deliverables that came out of that Herculean effort is a 177 page Big Sky Sustainable Watershed Stewardship Plan Report. Again, more words. That report was written by respect. Is anybody here that was authoring? Oh, God. <laughs> Thank you for raising your hand. You had a really big job. I see you, you brought in Mace. Um, <laughs> you and your team had a, a big job, and people get scared of 177 plus page reports. But I might suggest that by the end of this event, and the inspiration that you're going to hear, that you are going to read that thing, study it, and want to get engaged by the end of the week. <laughs> With that very short overview and with so much more to talk about, I'm going to now turn this conversation over to Kristen and Scott. And these two experts have 15 minutes. Jack is our, Jack right here is our timer. He's going to keep us on task. Kristen's going to give us more in-depth information about the water plan. She's going to, we have a map here because we, we really want you, us all, to understand where, what water are we talking about? And what really is a watershed? So she's going to start with the map, and then she's going to give us more background. Scott will then give us an American Rivers perspective on local, state, regional, and national perspectives, levels, as well as talk about the vision that this plan came up with. Kristen, take it away. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kristen Gardner, CEO of the Galveston River Task Force. I live here in Big Sky with my husband and my almost teenage son. And we love 
the Gallatin River, we recreate on it almost every day in the summer, and it's a really important part of our lives, like I imagine it is to most of you that are here in this room. So it's extra special for me to be working on this work um, with the Gallatin River Task Force. The Gallatin River Task Force is a nonprofit watershed group. We are located here in Big Sky. Watershed, there's over 60 watershed groups in the state of Montana, and we all have a few things in common. We work in a defined area, so our area is the Upper Gallatin Watershed, so from the headwaters in Yellowstone National Park all the way to Spanish Creek and all the lands and waters that contribute to the Upper Gallatin Water, uh, excuse me, Upper Gallatin River. There's also a watershed group called the Gallatin Watershed Council, and they focus on downstream uh, in Gallatin Valley and in Bozeman, and we collaborate a lot together because obviously water flows downstream and our work impacts theirs as well. Um, the Gallatin River Task Force has been involved in collaborative work in our community for a long time. Uh, there, when I took the job in 2007, there already was a collaborative called the Wastewater Solutions Forum that was looking at different solutions for wastewater that would have Pro, well, that would essentially make sure that we did not directly discharge wastewater into the Gallatin River. And this collaborative actually came up with a couple of really insightful studies. The first was um, the feasibility of connecting the septic systems down by the river to centralized treatment. And the second was looking at the feasibility of using treated wastewater for snow. You probably have heard a lot and read a lot about these two initiatives recently, but really this, this work started happening a long time ago. These projects take a lot of collaboration and a lot of investment. And there's been a lot of people that in this, in this room and some that have retired that have been really critical in moving these projects forward. When the economy tanked in 2008, there really was a stall in this collaborative work and we kind of picked the pieces back up again in 2015. 2016, as Meg has uh, talked about earlier, and created this gigantic collaborative. Um, the, the logo salad is missing, but there were 35 actually entities that were working on the water plan in Big Sky. And not only wastewater now, we we're also looking at water supply as well as um, the ecological health of a river, because you can't look at one of those without looking at the other. They all really impact each other. And so we got all these people in a room together and over two years um, prioritized initiatives for the future that would be, um, that would allow our community to grow sustainably, but also make sure that our rivers and waters were really protected. This plan did not sit on a shelf. This, it's called the Big Sky Sustainable Watershed Stewardship Plan. It was published in 2018. And we had some huge successes from this plan. It's, it's really been, um, really been great to be a part of it. And uh, there's a lot of people in, your room, in this room that have been integral into moving forward some of these projects that include upgrading wastewater to treatment, uh, both in Gallatin Canyon as well as in the Big Sky area. Uh, we also have looked at and actually have projects on the ground that are recycling water as snow. Uh, that actually happened for the first time this winter, which is a win-win for our community, for, for our community, both skiing and also for the watershed. We've expanded rest stream restoration projects. We've expanded our water conservation program. Just a lot of huge wins for uh, water in Big Sky. And we don't take enough time, I think, to celebrate this as a community. I'm really proud of all the work that we've done and all the partnerships that have really um, made all of this work successful. So. Um, now, it's been five years since the 2018 Watershed Stewardship Plan was produced, and we've come up with some additional challenges. And so like any other business plan or strategic plan, you need to take a step back and, you know, look at those challenges and reprioritize our steps moving forward. So that's what we did over this past year. We had brought all the stakeholders back together again. In some cases, some people have retired, so we had new representatives, but everyone was really willing to get back together again in the room and um, work on these problems. Like an algae, the algae blooms in the Gallatin, we didn't have that in 2015, 2016. So that was a new challenge that we need to think, had to think about and consider. 
We also have seen and, and know more science about the fact that we're going to probably see more drought and more flooding. So we have to think about that. Um, I would like everyone to stand up actually who was involved in some of these meetings over the winter to update this plan because there's quite a few of you here and I just want you everyone to see um, who all was involved in this plan update. So we're only going to skim the surface of the plan tonight and all the strategies that are we're going to move forward, but I really would like to offer, like, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody anytime. Our office is in the meadow. Our, our website is galaxyrivertaskforce.org, so more than happy to talk details um, if you want. But um, with that, thank you all again for coming out tonight, and I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Scott Bossy. Uh, we work collaboratively on a number of issues. Uh, this plan is one of them. We're also, we just had a, our bill for wild and scenic um, of the Gallatin and Taylor Fork go through a committee hearing this past week. So that was exciting and um, really enjoy working with Scott. Thank you, Kristen. Um, like I said, I'm Scott Bossy. I'm the Northern Rockies Regional Director for American Rivers. And before I get into why a national river conservation organization like American Rivers is involved in this particular project, I wanted to say a little bit, uh, some, something about myself. I've been in Southwest Montana for 24 years. Um, I've been working on water issues and wastewater issues in Big Sky that whole time, including with the Wastewater Solutions Forum. So there's a lot of familiar faces from uh, way back when in this room. Um, and let me tell you why I got involved in this project on a personal level. So the Gallatin River to me is super, super important. I, I raft on the river with my wife and my dog and my nieces and nephews. I fish on the river all the time. My wife is a ski patroller in Big Sky for eight years. I've been a season pass holder for 24 years. So this, I'm, I'm pretty attached to this community and certainly attached to the river. Um, but why would American Rivers get involved? That's like my personal reason for being involved in this project. But American Rivers is a national organization. We work in all 50 states. We only have about 100, about 100 staff across the country. So when, when we're made aware of an issue, we have to be really choosy about which issues we get involved in because it has to be an issue of national significance to merit our attention. So what attracted me to this particular group is the fact that we agreed on a mission a long time ago and we formalized it what, like a couple of years ago to, to, for Big Sky to be a model mountain community when it comes to water use and water reuse. And that was really the clincher for me. I would not be involved in American Rivers, would not be involved in this effort if we weren't creating a model that could be replicated in other places. And when, when I look at the other communities that we work in in the Northern Rockies, um, I, I've kind of done the research on this. You look at what Sun Valley is doing in terms of water use and wastewater uh, disposal. You look at Jackson, you look at Aspen, you look at all the model mountain or all the mountain communities across the West, none of them are doing what we're doing here. They're discharging treated wastewater that's treated at a lower level than is being treated here directly into surface waters in places like Jackson, Wyoming, which likes to make fun of Big Sky for using treated wastewater for snow making, guess where they discharge their treated wastewater? Into the federally wild and scenic designated Snake River. As a matter of fact, the outfall is right above the wild and scenic reach of the Snake River. So Big Sky is doing things here that other communities are not doing. Hopefully they're going to learn from what we're doing here. But I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that Big Sky is Montana's largest zero discharge community or a closed loop community. I mean, all the water that we use here, we reuse here and it's not discharged directly into the Gallatin River. And that did not happen by accident. It happened over a period of 20 some years of various stakeholders who used to kind of be at each other's throats, getting together, building trust with each other and coming up with solutions that are science-based and that invest in the community. So that's why American Rivers and National River Conservation Group sees what's happening here in Big Sky as a model that should that should be replicated elsewhere in the country. So hopefully, here we go. Uh, back to you, Mike. 
you've got two. <laughs> okay, thank you. If you're not inspired by that and also not impressed with the brain power and the expertise we have, I don't know what will impress you. Maybe you'll have to go to Jackson. <laughs> okay, the next part of the agenda, excuse me while I grab the next part. The plan, because it's huge, it had to get organized. They determined that there were three big topics to fall under. And these three fellas represent each of the three focus areas. We're going to start with the most heavy, Mr. Johnny O'Connor. This is the wastewater reuse committee. And your question, we're going to spend 15 minutes with each one of these gentlemen. And we're going to give one question to the, the lead. And then the other two get sub questions that relate to his topic. So we're going to kick off with Johnny because he's got the hardest. And the first thing you're going to do is define WRRF. So the new WRRF goes above and beyond state standards for water treatment. Without getting too much into the details, can you share information about the new facility's treatment capabilities and why it was so important to have a plant of this caliber in Big Sky? And you have five minutes. Well, I'll do my best to keep it short. Uh, WERF is a water resource reclamation facility. We actually have a membrane biochemical reactor is the actual technology that's used in our new facility. Um, and without going into too much of the details, uh, the MBR offers a comprehensive solution for wastewater treatment that not only improves operational efficiency and reliability, but also reduces costs, minimizes environmental impact, and ensures compliance with regulatory standards. The advantages make MBRs a preferred choice in many wastewater treatment applications for high quality effluent, public health and environmental stewardship is paramount. Okay, thank you. Why don't we take the next sub question and give it to Connor. Connor represents the Ecological Health Committee. Connor, your question is, how does this new facility treat the water to a higher level that will show real improvements and fewer impacts to the river? Sure, so as Johnny mentioned, uh, this is a state-of-the-art facility, and so it's able to treat wastewater or treat sewage to and reuse that wastewater um, and treat it to a very high standard. And so having this new um, treatment facility come online will enable us to treat that water to a higher standard, but also have a greater capacity to receive additional sewage from uh, septics and from both existing and new development. That happens. So um, currently, you know, there's a variety of different options when you want to treat wastewater. You can hook up to a facility like the one Johnny's been talking about, or you can have a septic tank. And septic tanks do a good job of treating wastewater if they're maintained and installed appropriately. But the hard part is a lot of people can't keep up with the maintenance, or it's hard to um, identify when there's a problem. I've had a septic before, and I just like look down a hole and assume it's working okay, right? So uh, this allows the opportunity to try and get more users um, on this state-of-the-art facility, which can then treat the water uh, to a higher standard. And so that's really important because right now we've got uh, leaky septics and things like that that can contribute nitrogen, phosphorus, to the groundwater, which then ultimately ends up into our river and can cause problems. So this creates an opportunity where we can offset some of that and put it into the wastewater treatment facility, they can treat it to a higher standard. And then that additional capacity can be used and reused wastewater um, on the landscape so that people aren't relying on the river or our aquifer to pump water out of it. So that keeps more water in our streams while the additional treated wastewater can be used elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Mike, we'll have you tell us, reused water is now viewed as an asset rather than a liability. This new facility presents a paradigm shift for Big Sky. Tell us more about that. Well, that's uh, it's all about the water quality of that reuse water, that effluent. I mean, the it's a significantly better end product uh, that this plant is going to be kicking out. So yeah, we've got snow making as an option now, but the the options of what we can do with this water in Big Sky uh, just are about to get a lot bigger. Um, irrigation of other landscapes other than golf courses, you know, private and public landscapes. 
can now be irrigated. Um, got snow making, uh, potential groundwater recharge. Um, we could even bolster stream flows with this water. I mean, uh, I would expect this water to become sought after in the future. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's just such a superior product that this plant is going to be kicking out. Um, and so thanks, John. <laughs> These things aren't easy or cheap to fill. Those are. <laughs> and, and we're going to have a little extra time because Johnny gave that back to us. Thank you. But before we get there, Johnny, tell us a little bit about the regulation situation that you're under. And I know you love this question. So there's two different kinds of regulations. There's permitted regulation, which we are not under, but we are under reuse regulation, which there are five classes. And we, with the new facility, operate in class A and class A1, which sets us up for unlimited use in the water, as it was previously mentioned. The MPDS permits regulate how much you can discharge into a receiving stream or body of water, uh, which is based off of uh, TMDLs, which is total max daily loads. Uh, but a reuse application uh, with Class A and Class A1 is based off of a more stringent criteria that often requires drinking water standards, uh, which makes it uh, really clean and gives us the ability to use it more than just your Because we have some time, why don't we do a few Q&A? Jack, will you keep us on target? Let's, if, if you would, keep it to the wastewater treatment and reuse part. We'll, we'll just see what happens. If anybody has a question that can address what's going on here, we'll let you go for it now instead of waiting till the end. Please, please say your name. Sally Moscow. I'd like to know how the, the uh, water that's cleaned up will be delivered to other, like to, are you going to send it to the Yellowstone Club or to, you know, for irrigation and all that? How will it be sent? So we already have infrastructure that goes up the mountain. Uh, we have seven miles of pipe and two pumping stations that deliver in capacity up to 160 million gallons a year that they use for irrigation. And as of last year, used 20 million for snow. So it already exists. It already exists, yes. Anybody else? Dave O'Connor. Thanks, Dave O'Connor. Sorry, Big Sky Resident. Oops. Um, John, you talked about uh, discharge of wastewater and what the high level that the effluent is treated to. And in my understanding, uh, many communities utilize a direct discharge into the stream, but Big Sky is not. Can you uh, confirm that and then talk a little bit about why Big Sky does not? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, since its inception, all of the treated water has been used for irrigation, uh, mainly in the meadow for the golf course. And then a few years ago, the you infrastructure know, was built to go up the mountain for additional irrigation. We irrigate the pastures and stuff. With the new facility, we still maintain 100% reuse, no discharge. Uh, the big ponds down there by the office, that's where we store it over the winter. And then we move water around during the summers and stuff. So Big Sky Water and Sewer District has no discharge permit, and we have no direct discharge into any receiving bodies or streams up here versus, you know, uh, Jackson Hole or Bozeman or other communities around us that do actually discharge into the river. Okay, let's move on to question number two. Again, excuse my back to the audience. Okay, water supply and availability, Mike. Below our feet runs some of the cleanest and coldest water in our ecosystem. How do we manage and replenish this precious resource in the face of climate change and growth in our community? Well, sounds easy enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, one of the takeaways from the recently completed uh, Bureau of Mines and Geology study in the meadow area is that 
the shallow aquifer under the meadow is really vulnerable to contamination from the surface. I mean, this aquifer is only 50 feet deep. So that's a big, we, we kind of knew this already, but knowing exactly where this aquifer is and where the recharge areas are, uh, it's gonna be important moving forward to just really keep that in mind that anything that we apply to the land surface above the shallow aquifers will end up in the aquifer. Um, so, you know, uh, it's just important things like aging or large septic systems, um, human and animal waste, fertilizers, chemicals. You know, we really want to watch what is going on on the surface of these shallow aquifers, especially. There's deeper aquifers as well that, quite frankly, are pretty safe and um, that are not vulnerable. But here in the meadow, you know, this aquifer that is a large part of our water supply certainly is quite vulnerable. So we want to just make sure to uh, be smart about what we do here and what we do above the surface of that aquifer. Okay, Connor, with a confined water supply, what are the greatest threats to the river from increased pressure on water resources and what restoration techniques can mitigate these threats? So uh, we mentioned climate change, climate change is, change is kind of the elephant in the room, uh, but then we've also, and that's gonna you know, decrease our snowpack. Uh, our rivers in this region and across the West really depend on slow melting snowpack to recharge our aquifers, which then feed our rivers. Um, but additionally, the other threats, you know, as more people move to this area, there's increased demand for the water, both in the form of wells and, and other um, ways to get at that water. And then also when we build more impervious surfaces and, and things like that, and also hook up to wastewater or septic um, systems, then we have to deal with some of that pollution that comes with the growing population. But um, on, on my side of thing where I do more restoration work, um, there are some solutions to try and keep um, our snowpack and our water in the, the basin as long as possible. Um, for better or worse, a lot of our landscapes across the West have been pretty altered historically, um, whether it was during timber harvest or um, cattle ranching or sheep grazing or all kinds of different things that we've done. So we've drained a lot of wetlands, we put drains in them, we've, uh, we've rerouted streams, straightened them out to accommodate roads, to accommodate a variety of different infrastructure. And if we can find ways to try to restore uh, those ecosystems so that they perform like they used to hydrologically, uh, it can not only uh, improve like the quality of habitat for fish and wildlife and things, but it also has the benefit of storing water and keeping on the landscape longer. So it has more time to actually absorb into the ground, become part of the groundwater and the aquifer, and then slowly feed back into the stream. So you'll hear a frustration from many people say slow the flow all the time. And we try and we want to keep water uh, in the basin and in our waterways and in, in our meadows as long as we possibly can. And the cool thing is, uh, we'll talk about this more, but uh, all those different restoration techniques also increase the natural uptake of excess nutrients as well. So they can have a variety of different methods. Okay, and Johnny, how do the achievements of the plan like snowmaking and the WRRF help us sub supplement our water supply resource? Well, the, the new treatment facility can take us to A1 standards, so it gives us more options um, to utilize things like snowmaking which also has permits on it. So you get a, you get double the, the standards and higher treatment efficiency. So the treatment facility treats it and then the snowmaking process also adds additional treatment, which makes the water quality even better. And then with the snowmaking, it gives us ability to basically store water up in the mountain that uh, slowly releases over time and actually Take stress or stress off the system by augmenting the stream flow, uh, and it eases the water supply in, in our droughts during hotter summers and so. So it, it gives us more ability to be able to keep water in, in the basin for a longer period of time. It, it seems to me that within water supply and availability, there are a lot of things that individuals and citizens can do. Well, let's one of the three of you take a crack at telling, informing what some of those things might be. 
Outside of snowmaking, I mean, virtually, there's a, a host of things that the high quality can do. You can take, uh, you know, fire protection and firefighting off of the water supply system. You can take irrigation of, you know, yards and flower areas and parks and stuff off of the water supply system. You can even hook up and put in non pot water to flush toilets and stuff in commercial buildings or even. In your house um, so there's a lot of things that can pretty much do things and then you got indirect indirect audible reuse where we can recharge aquifers either through surface or groundwater discharge uh in in order to help keep our aquifers clean and in pristine shape and, and keep the vulnerabilities out of it yeah uh on kind of ecological side of it um you know just minimizing how much uh, you irrigate your your uh, own property i mean a lot of us love green grass but there's other ways and other uses for our landscapes that we can have really beautiful landscaping but also just not utilize so much water um if, uh, you know in the summer that's one of the biggest uh uses of water and it doesn't return back to the stream a lot of it evaporates a lot of it um is taken up by the plant so it doesn't make it to the stream you know if you flush your toilet ends up in the wastewater treatment facility and then that water can get reused but if we water our lawns we don't get to reuse that water so you can plant out adopted plants you can zero escape your lawn you can do a variety of different things and if you do have grass which i have some grass otherwise it turns into a mud pit for my dogs um, just trying to minimize how much you're uh, watering them and make sure you water them not during the middle of the day when it's hot. So all that stuff just evaporates. Ooh, yeah. Don't water during the middle of the day. You will get shamed. <laughs> Mike, anything to add? Well, I'll just add that all, all these uses of the reuse water just lessen the amount of groundwater that has to get pumped out of the ground. And a lot of that, a lot of our aquifers here are connected to surface water. So pumping water out of the ground can impact stream flows. So all, all this stuff is a win in terms of just pumping less groundwater. Maybe some of you came tonight thinking, wow, this is gonna might be doom and gloom because we're hearing about we've got limits on water supply. This is pretty hopeful. Any any comments that anybody want to make on this? Yes, Mike. Years ago, there was a, a paper, a graph of supply and demand of our potable water, water, and that was a little scary. If you remember that graph, it had an intersection not too too many years out and such. A lot about what you're talking today is changing that graph, graph and that. I think it would be good as opposed to just mentioning all the different things it does is looking at the supply and demand and reprojecting what if there is an intersection and if there is how far it's out. It's an easy way for people that aren't up to date on everything that's happening to really, you know, in their own mind, take away the scare factor of what it what it looked like when that intersection was 10 years out or something. Actually, glad you brought that up. We're in the middle of doing that as we speak, uh, reformulating our water supply and what the projections will will look like. You know, over the years we've seen four, four and a half percent year over year growth rate for the last thirty years. Uh, so it's really important to really start focusing on our water supply and everything that can contribute to it, including reuse and the sustainability of it. We do have this uh, event being Zoomed. Jack, are there any questions online? Okay, we, you guys are doing so well. Right. Kevin, you're going to get to your entree before snacks. <laughs> Kristen, Scott, do you guys want to add anything? Um, so one of the solutions that we've been implementing in the last couple of years is using reclaimed water for snowmaking. And it sounds pretty simple, but uh, if you look back at the arc of this group working together, and Kevin, Jermaine, you were part of that group, I think Rich Chandler a long time ago, the DEQ in Montana wouldn't even let ski areas use reclaimed water for snowmaking. We literally had to go to the governor's office and meet with the DEQ, and we did it with conservationists, 
developers and like and business people from around the area, we, we came together and that made it a much more powerful presentation. And because of that, and because of the governor being receptive to our idea at the time, DEQ actually changed its rules in that respect. And now, not only is Big Sky leading the way, but I think other ski areas in Montana, I believe Bridger Bowles is even interested in, in, in replicating the concept there. And I think we're going to see more of it throughout Montana and more snowmaking using treated wastewater across the Northern Rockies. And that's something to be extremely proud of, but it was that that's the fruits of 24 years of labor. That, that didn't just happen. We actually had to change the interpretation of the rules and laws to make it happen. I just want to expand on a point that uh, Connor brought up, and that's the irrigation of lawns and your landscaping. Um, if that water that you're putting on your lawns would ultimately make it to the river at some point. So as you're thinking about your landscape, um, perhaps think about planting native plants. And the task force actually just received a $100,000 grant from the Bureau of uh, Reclamation that will help transform your landscape with native plants. So uh, we'll be releasing more information about that soon, but uh, it's one way that you all can help contribute to uh, lessening that impact of landscape irrigation on our rivers and streams. Okay, we are gonna move on to the third committee, ecological health. Connor, the middle section of the Gallatin was recently listed as impaired, along with existing impairments on the West Fork, the South Fork, and the Middle Fork. Can you tell us what specific strategies have been and will be implemented to improve ecological health? Sure. So um, as I, I mentioned some of this before, but the landscape has been degraded. Um, it's, it's hard to see you with like the untrained eye, um, but pretty much all of our landscape across the West has been degraded to some extent. And uh, with Plum Creek typically or historically owning a bunch of this stuff, they did a really good job of manipulating the landscape. So um, it provides the opportunity to kind of have some ecological uplift, which also helps with water supply and helps with water quality, which is really exciting. So um, yeah, there are some local examples of projects that have been done. The task force has led a lot of them. Um, the one that's on the screen behind you, um, uh, WHM group, uh, Jeff's here, um, put this together with the task force when we just helped out. Uh, but this is an example of um, some of the infrastructure, uh, green infrastructure that we would like to uh, install in our rivers and in our meadows to try and to kind of get them back to where they used to be. So this is the Middle Fork, West Fork. Um, it used to have probably a giant beaver complex. You could probably actually, when you're out on the ground, you can find old beaver dams that are built out there and that have been breached historically. Uh, and so WGM Group uh, worked with the task force and they built, created a design where they installed these different uh, log dams you can see kind of alternating the flow there, and that helps to bring up the water table and reconnect it out into the floodplain. That allows the water to slowly soak into the groundwater and become stored. And then over during the summer, that water can slowly make its way back into the stream. So that's one example. And while this is kind of like a smaller project, there's so many opportunities to do this at a larger scale uh, in Big Sky. And talking kind of everywhere from like the valley bottoms to um, the ridge tops. There's wet meadows way up uh, on the ski hills and and all over the place that have been drained and things like that for people to access uh, timber and harvest it historically. So there's just a ton of opportunities to do more things like this. Uh, the task force also has done some stream access improvements along the Gallatin. And while those might seem like they're super recreation focused, they also have a ton of, of side benefits also for water quality, reducing fine sediment inputs from people trampling and creating uh, user trails and roads all over the floodplain. Instead, that water can now infiltrate in the soil and start running off with mud and, and fine sediment into there. So there's a variety of projects that we can we can do there, and they have a bunch of planning documents that are out there. So if you're interested in learning more about those types of projects, they've already a lot of them have been created. We just got to get landowner buy-in and funding, and we can start doing more of those projects. Uh, then on the snowmaking side of things, um, it also is just again we can't reiterate how cool the snowmaking thing is. Um, it's water that otherwise would just be running out of the basin. It's now going up on the in uh, snowpack and slowly melts and how many inches is 19 inches or something like that johnny i don't know it's something significant like 19 inches of snow that they're they're able to build and so then 
you can just imagine that snow pack just slowly melting, getting additional treatment before it actually makes it into the groundwater and ultimately in the stream. So those are just some examples of stuff that um, on the ecological side are benefiting our environment and can help you know, our aquatic ecosystems and our, our trout fisheries. Johnny, can you please explain how expanded reuse through practices like the snowmaking and irrigation help late summer stream flow without having to directly discharge into the river? So back to what you produce, and um, we give a little backstory. My first 100% uh, zero discharge facility was in 2003 back in Kansas where I'm from, and it was the first facility that uh, had ponds out front, 100% reused stock of fish, people had access to it. Um, and then because of the high evaporation rates over the summer, it hardly ever discharged into the receiving stream in which we had a permit for. So the whole front of the plant, uh, including wetlands and even some mitigated wetlands, was all fed from that facility. So coming up here to, to Big Sky, um, you know, that was one of the biggest things that, that attracted with 0% uh, discharge into the river but with reuse and at the level that we treat it to it's not degrading to the environment uh, and it also makes its way into the surface over a longer period of time through snow making so so during the late summer when we get hot river flows get down and stuff we've still got water coming off the mountain that can help increase flows and increase our demand or lessen the demand on our system uh, through through that longer snow pack public. Okay, Ma Mike, can you explain the connection between groundwater and ecological health of surface water for everyone? Sure, no problem. <laughs> um, maybe. Groundwater and surface water are connected. This is, uh, this is a known concept for a long time, it, but it truly uh, is the reality here in Big Sky, um, especially again in these shallow aquifers. Uh, kind of the scenario we've got going here is that like in the meadow, there's a deposit under us. It's some of it's glacial, some of it's river derived. So these are, this is an unconsolidated deposit cobbles, sand, gravel, it's in this basin. It's about 50 feet deep and 50 feet thick. Uh, when the streams that come out of the mountains, like the North Fork and the Middle Fork, start flowing across this deposit, they start losing water out of the bottom of the stream bed into the aquifer. So these streams all start losing water, the upper ends of these aquifers. Uh, that's the recharge source or, you know, that's the water that we're drinking. Uh, towards the lower end of the aquifer, this deposit completely pinches out. So the deposit disappears. So that water's all gotta go somewhere and it goes back into the stream. So, th so that's the connection, that's the scenario with the connection here in Big Sky. Uh, so if you think about it, um, yeah, what, what happens to the stream ends up in the aquifer. And then what if you what happens to the aquifer ends up back in the stream? So the the streams and our shallow aquifers truly are connected here in Big Sky. So you know if if we if we pollute a stream, we might end up polluting a well, maybe your own well, maybe a public water supply well. Uh, so if and if we overload an aquifer with nutrients or contaminants. Um, we're also likely going to be impacting a stream. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's our that's how connected things are here. Could you present that to the U.S. Supreme Court? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think they can't the surface water and groundwater connection, right? Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions or need any third grade vocabulary around that? That was pretty third grade-ish because I tracked it. <laughs> is there anything more about that? That's fascinating stuff, right? So cool. And we live right here in the middle of it. I would like to go off script a little bit and this don't get scared, but Connor, tell us when Kristen and, and the ecological crew says, make it messy. What does that mean? 
Yeah, so um, historically, our streams would have been a lot messier than they are right now. Uh, we tend to clean our streams. We can seem to think that we need to have these really clean, straightforward streams that we can like paddle a canoe down. But historically, that wouldn't have been the case, right? There was beaver dams absolutely everywhere. There's trees falling in the river, falling, uh, forming log jams. It's a pretty recent thing that we've got this in our head that a view of a stream is this really simple channel that is like free of uh, log jams and things like that. That's a very new thing, but we've all grown up around streams like that. So that's what we expect. But um, the reality is that they should be really messy. And I like to tell people when I do my fisheries work, um, if a stream is a big pain in the ass to walk through, which that usually means it's a pretty good habitat. So uh, the messier we can make the streams, the more it slows it down, it spreads that water out and has a chance to recharge aquifers and stay in the landscape longer. But also the messiness of our streams when we do things like put trees in it and things like that creates really diverse habitat for different aquatic organisms, not just trout, but other organisms as well. And so you need a mixture of pools and ripples and runs and off-channel habitat and all kinds of different stuff for these different life stages of fish and other things. So if you can make our stream messy, make our floodplains messy, make our headwater meadows messy, it just slows the water and creates these little microhabitats for all these awesome organisms that we all move to Montana to spend time and, and see. So yeah, that's kind of the messy side of things. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, messy's good. I used to work as a fishery biologist. We'd always say, wood is good, right? I mean, that's where all, especially with bull trout, that's where all the fish hang out. It's in the log jam. So, yeah, I'm a messy person, too. <laughs> we all hear stories of the new, the new residents and their ideas of how they want their beautiful piece of land to look. How, how can we engage and um, participate in a really, oh, a conversation that gets us to them thinking messy's good. Yeah, it's, it's challenging. I think, um, you know, I'd love to just take some people and put them in a uh, dry suit with a snorkeling mask and stick them underwater and show them where all the fish hang out. And then it starts to click for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it starts with education and explaining to people that, you know, our stream banks aren't supposed to have grass right up to the, the cobbles. You're supposed to have um, plants that provide shade to the stream so it doesn't get super hot, but it can provide leaf litter for all the little macroinvertebrates to feed on, which feed our fish. So it's, it just takes education. It takes time. Um, also, I, you know, I would love to see when people move to an area and they buy a piece of property next to a stream, a little bit of educational material comes with them with the realtor, like, hey, your property might flood. Um, also, you should probably leave that vegetation there because it'll probably save you a lot of money uh, during the flood and all the other good stuff that um, people should be doing um, with their stream adjacent property. So I think education is really important and the task force does a great job with education. And I think um, Kristen has mentioned the Lower Gallatin, uh, the Gallatin Watership Council, and they've got some great materials they're, they're putting together, and hopefully we can all work together and kind of use them throughout the valley. Do any of the experts in the audience want to comment on any of this ecological health stuff? Okay, well, we are running wildly ahead of schedule, which means I'm going to let Kristen start talking about the Canyon Water and Sewer District. I bet Mays could um, join in if I get any of the facts wrong. But um, is so, Jeff running away? Where are you going? <laughs> uh, the Canyon Water and Sewer District is is one of the huge successes from that 2018 plan, and really that conversation started in back in 2008 when we started doing a feasibility of connecting those septic systems that are right along the river to centralized treatment, which is much cleaner. And so the 2018 plan had an initiative that we want to address septic systems. And so we we formed a committee right after the plan was produced in 2018. Dave O'Connor, you were part of that committee um, to work on building and forming a water and sewer district that would eventually connect to this MBR treatment plan. And so we've created a water and sewer district and Mace has been running that district. Uh, they've had they've had started with four landowners uh, that were part of the district, and now they've expanded to twenty five. Twenty five. A lot more landowners. So that's super exciting. 
uh, where we've received significant funding from the resort. And I shouldn't say we, because I'm not part of it, but um, the, the Canada district has received significant funding from the resort tax, as well as ARPA grants from the county and the state. And so we have quite a bit of uh, capital to start with, but I think they still are looking to raise additional funding. I think they're giving a presentation tomorrow at the Water and Sewer District Board meeting at 8 a.m. at the Water and Sewer District. If you want to learn more, but really it's uh, it's pretty exciting. This was a proactive movement. We were not forced to create a Water and Sewer District, so it's something that our community, I think, needs to be really proud about. Yeah. So I do want to give the task force some credit. This the concept of sewer in the canyon, I think, was originally explored in 2008 uh, with the uh, I draw a blank on this acronym too, or Big Sky Water Solutions Forum and the Sustainable Stewardship. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that put it on the radar and gave it some clout. And within a year or two of putting that publicizing. The task force was able to fundraise enough money to do the feasibility study. WGN group working with AE2S put up the feasibility study and I honestly thought it might stop there. It was gonna be an expensive endeavor, but with this community, it, it found a way. Uh, not only did the community step up with the 1% for infrastructure and $12 million for that project, but the, we'll say the development community and the demand down in the canyon took the initiative to form a district. That wasn't WGM, that wasn't task force, that was, here's how you implement the project. It requires a lot of money. So the, the, the Canyon Sewer District was formed in 2020, the December 2020, the feasibility was study was done in May 2020. So eight months later, nine months later, that utility district was formed. That put into motion chasing money and solidifying plans and the momentum that has grown in terms of the actual project legs and the benefits for the community, plus the benefits to the river. Plus, as we dove into kind of the risk of septic system to wells, that human health benefit of pulling those contaminants out of the aquifer to the same drinking water source that a lot of those community members get their water from, that just elevates the merits of the project in general, and that momentum has continued, and we hope to maintain it. So, how many potential users do you have? Uh, we're in the twenty plus parcels. Um, some notable ones, including future development that is looking to bring employee out, increased employee housing. But the map that's on your screen it might be tough for you to see, but we're tracking annexations from roughly the stoplight down to the school. That's kind of that ideal spectrum of, let's get all the way down to the school, the more users that come on, the better the benefit to the river, the better benefit to drinking water. Um, the actual numbers of users is more driven by the, the parcels and the use. Um, for example, Bucks T4 houses a lot, is a commercial entity and it's hundreds of users, I guess is the short answer to your question. Go ahead, any more questions around this? Yeah, Kevin. Hey, what do you see is, what, what's the latest numbers to run sewer all the way down to the school in the black? What, what sort of dollars are we looking at? Yeah, I'll project a total budget of about 50 million. We're phasing the project to where we can maintain the economic affordability of the best the communities need. And the further you go down the canyon, the more the more expensive it is per user. The, the center of mass is really in the north end of the valley. And honestly, the center of the mass of the nutrient load and the septics that we're trying to collect are in the north end of the valley. So it's a 30 to $50 million project depending on those limits. Go on. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Well, it's, it's related because if, if, if we sewer the canyon and we take that up to the new plant, I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so sorry, this question is for Johnny. Is uh with with the my understanding the new plant capacity can be doubled for 
not that much more money that could handle the flow of the canyon if this community were to come up with the financial resources. And so my um, question to Mr. Connor is what is the cost of the next phase of the plan expansion? In today's dollars, it's probably 10 million to, we've already put uh, the infrastructure in, um, that was some good foresight and thinking to already have the concrete work and, and most of that in place. So now it's just adding the equipment for the additional treatment that would take us to 3 million. So right now in today's numbers, it's, uh, it's about 10 million or so, 10 to 12 million to, to do that. Uh, Danny Gershwald, just curious, Mace, the conversation about disposal that was happening earlier. Um, I'm curious if there's any connectivity with that objective for um, not direct discharging into the Gallatin, if there's opportunities created from the Canyon District. Yeah, so as part of the Canyon Feasibility Study and then the Preliminary Engineer Report, the end goal is a co-solution where collect sewer down in the canyon, pump it to the Big Sky Water and Sewer District, New Wharf, and then be a relief valve to the Big Sky Water and Sewer District to go downhill and groundwater discharge. So aquifer recharge with high quality effluent, that becomes an option for the community. I think snowmaking is an elegant solution of it, stores it up high, you get extra treatment. So that, that can be plan A. What I really like about the canyon is it's downhill, it's winter discharge, it's, you can time it with the seasonal uh, increased impairment risk to the Gallatin River. Like when you're discharging the groundwater in say May, that nutrient load could make it to the river through a lot of mechanisms of groundwater treatment. So that's all healthy, but that ideal discharge is actually snow making where you get that pulse out of the system and then you can be that groundwater discharge relief valve in the community during a high snow year. You're not pumping it uphill if you don't need to. So it's a relief valve for the community to use. And it's great that this community has the foresight to implement land application, irrigation, reuse, snow making, groundwater discharge, that whole toolbox before even thinking about surface water discharge. And then we have. Is there any like, feasibility for the district to expand south, like towards Cinnamon, where all those ranches are at? Yeah, so the feasibility study looked all the way to the corral bar. There's a starts to be a big gap, and your cost to run pipe per amount of septic you collect just skyrocket. Um, so that's as far as we took the feasibility study, and honestly landed at kind of the school of being that break-even point of, okay, your your dollars per benefit to the river start to decrease a lot. Long-term, I could see it creeping down the valley, but yeah, to get to the corral is a whole other strategy, in my opinion. Um, is there a reasonable guess on timeline, or is it cost-dependent um, or parcel-dependent? Or other yeah. timeline I've started throughout there is 2027 construction. I caveat that I'm an optimist and a lot of things need to go right. Mm -hmm. But that's also when a lot of the grant funding that's been secured, we need to keep that in motion to hold that pace. So we'll put a 2027 number out there. Uh, I have one clarification on uh, what Kevin was asking. Uh, so we're 30 to 50 million for the Canyon District. Is that additional 10 million to make it get up to the, the plant in, in that, or was that an either or, or was that an addition to? <laughs> we'll say the $10 million expansion to the treatment plant would be in addition to the 30 to 50 million. It's probably the safe way to categorize that. Um, I think there's a phasing element that maybe the existing work could handle Canyon flows in the near term, but that's a balancing act of when does that canyon put that, tip the, I guess, put the Big Sky Water and Sewer District over the hump of needing to make that commitment. So add another 10 million, I guess, is short answer. Any other questions on this one? Dave. Can you talk a little bit about that, the initial funding that got the, um, 
Canyon Water and Sewer District started and then funded the work up there also. Can you talk a little bit about that source and how that came about? Yeah, so when we did the feasibility study in 2020, I honestly thought the project would sit on the shelf and we would see what would happen. Uh, but through this community, the 1% for infrastructure, so that's 1% additional resort tax on top of the standard 3%, which creates that pipeline to fund some critical projects, including the Big Sky Treatment Plan upgrade, but $12 million was earmarked as part of that community vote. And that's really when the project gained momentum, but that base funding commitment allowed the project to advance to preliminary engineering, which allowed the Candy District to go after additional grant funding, which has translated into another three plus million dollars combination federal state ARPA money, also Gallatin County ARPA money. Um, and the Canyon continues to chase more funds. And my optimism is with the Canyon District going from four parcels to 20 plus parcels, and the more benefits we identify, the more funding opportunities we, we can see. Does that answer your question, Dave? As long as you're talking about the 1%. Yeah, 1% put it in motion. That was a good decision. Any other Wash Canyon questions? Ladies, do you have any questions? Another question? You're good? Okay. We can't open it up now because the official agenda is over with. Questions, any other questions? You've been doing really good. I'm really happy with the audience participation. Thank you. And if there are more that are related to anything, now's the time to let it rip. Hey, Danny. I'm looking at this, uh, Danny Beers, well, I'm looking at this great handout that you have here, 2023 data results for nutrients and algae. And um, it starts at the headwaters, but then kind of like tapers off at Stormcastle. I'm curious if there's any way that um, we could have a greater insight of the full watershed and what the downstream impacts might be, particularly as it relates to uh, other communities that might be facing similar issues that are directly discharging into the river downstream. What's the nutrient load when the, when that water is actually hitting the Missouri and forming the Missouri? Has any analysis been done on the Gallatin River at, at large? Yes, um, the Gallatin, I know the DEQ along with the Gallatin Watershed Council and actually um, I believe the DEQ is here somewhere. Um, th there's a lot of that data and a lot, of, a lot of information on the Lower Gallatin that we certainly can put together um, by working with the Gallatin Watershed Council and the DEQ. But the data is out there. Yeah, you can go online and look at uh, just Google DEQ water impairment mapper, and there's a map, and you can go on there, and it'll show the most recent data for the different stretches and which ones are impaired. So you can go on there, but um, as far as my knowledge is that any of the other sections of the Gallatin are not listed um, currently for any impairments. Yeah, the, the West Gallatin, but then the East Gallatin is listed. Yeah, there's yeah. some, the middle section of the East Gallatin is, is listed. Did that answer your question, Danny? Yeah. yeah, and like some of that data is not super new and it should get updated and things like that. I think, you know, Jeff, you were a part of collecting some of that data, but um, it's due for an update, but you can find some of it online. So. Great question. Anything else? Jack. Um, we had a question from the zoo. Are there any plans for Big Sky Resort to start making snow reuse water? Because last year they ran out of all their water by December and it affected snow conditions. First of all, we should fact check. Stacy, can you comment on that? Do you have that? Okay. That could be a, a, a not true information, but it's a great question. So who who's gonna answer this baby? <laughs> no? No takers? Okay, well, thank you for that question. We will get your name and we will get some information to you through um, electronically. Anything else?
Um, algae, algae blooms. So we've been working with the Montana DEQ for the last four years now, collecting data to better understand what is causing the blooms. And um, it's it's quite um, possible that there there's different causes in different areas of the watershed because we're seeing blooms in the Taylor Fork and we're seeing blooms you know, upstream of Big Sky as well as downstream of Big Sky. So we have another year or two of data collection um, to, you know, further determine what is going on out there. But it's, algae blooms are complex. There's a lot of different factors that play a role. And, um, and we've seen different conditions um, across the years. So, um, but I think we should have answers pretty soon. We have the DEQ is pour, pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars into their water quality mo monitoring program, and we're part of that as well. And we're working collaboratively to collect the the data that we need to be able to um, move before move forward the most effective solutions. Well, Kristen, does does the DEQ have a public meeting scheduled at all for this stuff like this fall or something? Are they planning on anything? We had a public meeting, was it like a month ago maybe-ish yeah. that we hosted here? I think you maybe were in Texas. Oh, you were there. No, I was there. Oh, you were there. Yeah. Right, you were there. Yes. Sorry. But maybe there's another one coming up. Another one? I don't know. I was just wondering. I don't, I don't think there's another one. Well, I think that I was impressed at that meeting. I was there and, and they, they, these guys are on it there, and uh, I think there already are some pretty significant knowledge gains in this watershed from their work, and that I would expect to continue. So if you if you hear of an of a, another public meeting, I'd encourage you to attend. It was actually really informative. I got a question for you, Connor. What you got? So we've talked about all these human interventions to reduce nutrient pollution around Bay Sky and, and other innovations. How have trout populations been doing on the Gallatin River? Like, in the, if you look at the last twenty years, what are the trends, and how do those trends compare to other nearby watersheds? Yeah, so uh, the Gallatin has a lot of good things going for it. It's a free flowing stream. We don't have to worry about um, you know large dams or anything on it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a ton of really strong data um, over the past twenty years. Uh, there was a gap in there where there wasn't a lot of monitoring done by FWP. Um, however, they did pick up monitoring um, three years ago. They started monitoring. They've been doing the lower Gallatin, um, and then also they started doing the upper Gallatin. And that data, um, from what I understand and what I've observed and, and discussed with FWP, and is Keith here? Oh, yeah, sorry. Keith's not in. Uh, Keith probably could talk to this better than I can, but my understanding is that uh, <laughs> their numbers are pretty similar to what they saw historically. So. <laughs> I was just no, I was just waiting to see if Connor had some better information than me. On it. But um, yeah, like Connor said, I mean, especially in the Upper Gallatin, it's been monitoring has been a little bit inconsistent. And I mean, the Gallatin River upstream of uh, like Four Corners, and uh, you know, like Connor mentioned, we established a new monitoring reach in 2021. Um, it was kind of a combination of a couple of historic reaches. It, it's about two and a half miles just downstream from the Exxon in town. Um, that's where it starts. And so we're gonna be monitoring that um, for at least the next two years so we can at least establish a baseline for, for what the trout populations in that section look like. And we think it's gonna be a, a pretty good indicator reach, uh, you know, moving forward. And so we'll, we'll establish the frequency and, and which we're going to be sampling that after we have three years of data. Um, but we do have reaches down um, near Logan on the lower Gallatin that have been monitored uh, for the last 20 years or so. Um, and the populations there tend to be pretty stable. Um, same with two reaches that we have on the East Gallatin. Um, you know, there's some natural demographic fluctuation of the populations from year to year, but um, we don't really see, you know, a declining or, or increasing trend in those data. Um, 
but but those are reaches that we were monitoring annually. And uh, Keith, the new region, uh, Madison Gallatin biologist for FWP, if you're curious. I do want to, uh, we're going to start to wrap up. Sound good? Any, any, uh, any other takers or questions? Yes, Randy. So my question is for John. <clears throat> Out of all the new test wells that you guys have done in the last few years, did you find one that was viable? Oh, uh, we actually haven't any done any test wells. Well, we done one nine. And it was pretty good. It was promising, but it's uh, it can't be used for public water supply. It's in their own place. Okay. Okay. Well. I think this has been a great conversation. There are a few things I want to say before we go. The people that drove here, thank you. It was kind of a, um, a tough day for weather on June 20th or whatever it is. And the regulatory, the agencies that came, thank you for your participation and for your care in what we're doing down here. And one of the big goals is to make this whole thing scalable and share with other communities so that Big Sky is one of well, it is a big partner in water resource leadership and protection. Um, there are some people on the Gallup River Task Force board, and I want to thank you for being here. Thank you, Commissioner Jen, for being here. It's great to have you. I didn't see anybody from Madison County, but um, those two are big funders for this effort. The last thing we'll say is, okay, now what? Five years all kinds of amazing stuff, accomplishments, so much more work to do. So now what? Who wants to answer this one? Anybody? <laughs> Can I just also recognize Kevin and Danny from Resort Tax who also significantly contributed to this effort? Yeah. 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 Sorry. I yeah. didn't make sure that yeah. that was known. Yeah. Bizrad, Gallup, and uh, Madison counties. Thank you. Okay, what's next? Can I, can I thank someone? <laughs> someone for thanking people. He was thanked earlier, but we heard a lot about snowmaking and mm -hmm. how integral that really is going to be moving forward. There was a Herculean lift that happened by Rich Chandler. <laughs> and I mean, this would not have happened without this guy. I mean, so thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. You contribute a whole lot more than just the snowmaking, too. Your leadership is remarkable. Okay, what is next? Who can take the microphone for this one? Can I offer one thing? Yes, please. You have a question, I'm going to answer it. So Kristen talked earlier about the Montana Headwaters Legacy Act, which had a hearing in the Senate um, last week, and hopefully that will pass at the end of this Congress after the election and before the next Congress convenes, but that legislation would get the highest level of federal protection available by law to the Taylor Fork and the Gallatin River from the Yellowstone Park boundary down to Spanish Creek. And that would be a, a huge, huge accomplishment. That one bill would double the number of protected river miles in the state of Montana. So if anyone wants to learn more about that, you can talk to Kristen and myself, and we'd be happy to discuss what you can do. Meg, can I be a smart out? <laughs> I watched him sneak in the room and I know where he's sitting. Uh huh. Uh, I I know. Do this he was falling asleep, actually. Yeah. Uh huh. I want to give a big shout out for Ron Edwards, my yes. predecessor. Uh, he's been here the last 30 years and has really led the district to uh, very well today into what I'm taking over and leading into the future. So thank you, Ron. Yeah, thank you, Ron. And you never know if you should call Ron out unless he's sitting up here. So um, I'm glad we're awake. Uh, yeah, and it was a debate if who, who should be sitting here. And thank you for for using. For you. It wasn't a debate for me. I <laughs> you didn't have a choice because we wanted this to be Johnny's coming out party, so you can all see who the crazy guy is that moved to Montana and brought all his amazing expertise. So thank you, Johnny, for agreeing to do this, moving here.
Okay, what's next? I know one of the things that I learned when I came on this project in January was, that dang it, this is not a Gallatin River Task Force thing. We are just a member. We always, it, it's great to be considered the leader, but we also, for that, we have to take all the hardship that Johnny now does and that it is, was going on, is going on over here. So what's next is Gallatin River Task Force is, and if he wasn't part of this whole deal, holy mackerel. Thank, Thank you very you much. <laughs> yeah, he, he really nailed it. Um, okay, and, and so I think, to, Another thing that has happened in the last six months is that in addition to three, these three committees that will carry on the hard work, there is a new committee formed, and it's the Communications and Public Relations Committee. And there are some of the members that came here tonight. Thank you for your expertise. And they will be working very hard to come up with um, great public relations and communications to get this out there, to get the, the great story that's going on. With that, we'll call it a night. Please, please, please.